So hello everyone, uh, you're very welcome today. Uh, this is a webinar on the lived experiences of welfare to work, uh, hosted by MUSI, so Maynooth University Social Science Institute, and the Governing Activation in Ireland project, which is led by my colleague, Dr. Michael McGann. Uh, I'm Nuda Whelan from the Department of Sociology here at Maynooth, and I'm going to be chairing the session today. We have a great lineup of speakers, um, Dr. Joe Whelan, Dr. Philip Finn and Dr. Michael McGann, followed by two discussions from Breed O'Brien and Dr. Anne-Marie McGarren. Um, so I'll introduce each of them um, when it's just before their time to speak. And um, hopefully please use the chat, uh, the Q&A function and send us in your questions. So we'd be delighted to get those as we go through. So we might leave the question and answer session until the end. Um, so maybe just to contextualize today's session and give you a little bit of an introduction to what we're going to be talking about. Um, as I said, it's a focus on lived experiences of welfare to work. So we know that welfare and employment services have been undergoing continuous reform really in the last uh, decade or so. And in the next 12 months, uh, we expect to see even further change with the procurement of new national employment service and multiple regional employment services to supplement Intrio's activation service. So focusing on those most affected by welfare reforms, this seminar brings together the latest research, which explores job seekers' experiences of activation and employment services. So it asks who or how do job seekers experience welfare to work? To what extent do participants find employment services helpful? And what changes would service users like to see to the way that employment services are delivered? The aim is to give voice to the perspectives, the understandings and the experiences of service users and claimants. These are the people who are most impacted by the welfare and PES reforms. And all too often their lived experiences is hidden in official evaluations of programmes, which are predominantly using econometric approaches to statistically examining the net impacts of programs on exits from the live register, on progressions into employment and or on people's earnings. And these are important outcomes to evaluate, but they reveal little about how or why programs achieve the outcomes that they do or their unintended consequences or about what the experience, the experience of participation is for job seekers. Uh, and these are things that Evelyn Brodkin has focused on and calling it the missing middle of policy analysis. And she asked questions like, did people receive the types of supports that they were hoping for? How were they made to feel by frontline staff? What was most or least helpful about the support that they received? And what could have been done differently to further improve employment services? So these are no less significant questions to understand than the net impacts of programs on transitions to employment or exits from the live register. So we hope to open up a discussion on uh, these kind of important points um, during this session today. So as I said, please do send us in your questions throughout. Um, each of the three speakers will speak for 15 minutes and they'll be followed then by eight minutes each per discussant. Um, and hopefully we will have time at the end. So I'll try and do my job of uh, managing the time today uh, as well as possible to allow for questions and answers. So without further ado, we might hand over to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Joe Whelan, an Associate Professor in the School of Social Work and Social Policy at Trinity College in Dublin. Joe's main area of interest uh, focuses on exploring the nexus of work and welfare. He's particularly interested in exploring and understanding lived experiences in the context of welfare recipiency, focusing on the processes and effects of welfare conditionality. And Joe has an upcoming monograph, uh, Hidden Voices, Lived Experiences in the Irish Welfare Space, which will be published by Policy Press in May 2022. So you're very welcome, Joe, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Nola. Um... Good morning or good afternoon, should I say, everyone. Um, so I'm going to try and share my screen. So you perfect. can see just the screen there, is that right? Yeah, perfect. Right. Um, so before I start, I just want to say a big thank you uh, for, for asking me to take part in this session. 
and thanks to Michael in particular. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the hard work that the organizers do when it comes to webinars like this as well. Uh, it's the on-scene work, it's the creating the links, bringing everybody together, packaging everything. It's often stuff uh, that doesn't get seen, but it's really, really important. Um, and it, it allows everything to run smoothly. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here. I think this is a, a really important session and it's launching a really important report. And on a personal level, I'm very happy to get an opportunity to do something uh, with Michael, even if it is something relatively minor, it's, it's a pleasure to be able to work with him. Um, but more importantly, I'm grateful for the, the scholarship and the rigor that he brings to bear in this particular area of research. And it's an area of research that's quite close to my own um, and indeed quite close to my heart. Um, and that's because this report, which I've had the pleasure of reading an early draft of, uh, deals with lived experience, uh, as Nola said in her introduction. Um, it deals with a type of evidence that goes beyond the econometric uh, to actually begin to understand uh, people's experiences um, and, and how they're affected by policy on the front line. Um, and I think that's very important. Uh, and because I think that's very important, that's what I'm going to focus on uh, for the most part today. Um, so I'm going to talk about the lived experiences of foreign knowledge. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, qualitative research with big Q qualitative values. Um, and what I'm hoping is that in doing that, uh, I tee up the other uh, presenters um, who will follow me. So hopefully it will all make sense as I go through. So um, I think I've already been very well introduced. Uh, if you want to get in touch with me, you can do so by email. Um, I'm also on Twitter. Uh, and you can check out uh, what I do there as well. So as I said, I want to talk about Big Q qualitative research and the idea of lived experience as a form of knowledge, and then how we can strengthen the idea of lived experience as a form of knowledge by introducing this lens, uh, which comes from the literature, uh, shared typical, the idea of shared typical experience types as part of a holistic evidence base for social policy. And I'll give some examples of the above. Um, so that's what I want to cover. Um, so as Nola said, uh, I have a monograph which is uh, going to be published in May uh, 2022. Um, and I'm drawing on that, uh, particularly from the first chapter of that today uh, in, in my presentation. Um, so, you know, there, there are question marks around the experience um, and qualitative research in the general sense and the validity of it as a form of evidence. Um, and I felt in writing the book that I had to make a case uh, for lived experience. And so I had to very much um, say why I felt it was a valuable type of research and a valuable type of social scientific knowledge. Um, and I think even the fact that I felt the need to do that um, tells its own story. Um, because I did get caught up in the numbers game in the research that I was doing. I, I worried had I spoken to enough people. Um, and, you know, those are concerns that really are linked to a different type of research or research that's concerned with numbers. Um, but nevertheless, I fell into that trap of worrying about numbers. And in actual fact, what we try to do as qualitative researchers is move beyond numbers to offer a depth uh, and breadth of understanding. Um, so I think there's a kind of a broad sense that certain types of evidence and knowledges are more accepted than others. And, I want to kind of maybe illustrate that by um, offering uh, a bit of an anecdote. Um, so it's important to say that um, in offering this anecdote, it's not my intention to uh, personalize this or, or to demonize anybody. Rather, this is just for illustrative purposes in respect to how certain types of evidence are viewed at very high levels. And um, so in a Twitter exchange with uh, the then Minister for Employment Affairs and Social Protection, Regina Doherty, um, I put it to her that it was disappointing to hear her dismiss valuable research for having what she suggested was a small sample size. So um, she was on a radio program called The Business, which was on Saturday morning on RT Radio 1. The topic for discussion was long-term unemployment. Um, job pack came up. Um, and it was at this point that uh, research conducted by academics based in the Waterford Institute of Technology, which is based on the lived experience of people, uh, was cited. But it was dismissed by the minister. Um, as not having had a big enough sample size. So um, I uh, took to Twitter, uh, as I was wanting to do at the time, and I also had a beard at the time. Um, I'm 
not as inclined to use Twitter as a vehicle for, for these kinds of discussions anymore, but at the time I was, I suppose, trying to, to be more proactive as a researcher in terms of dissemination of ideas. Um, and I put it to the minister that it was disappointing to hear her um, dismiss valuable qualitative research. Um, and I suggested that it showed the bias that exists in government circles who would rather quote figures than draw on the experiences of those who their policies affect. So I probably could have put it a little better, but I think that was the general point I was trying to make. And the minister responded, um, suggesting that they never dismiss anybody's experience, but making the point that 121 interviews uh, out of 193,000 unemployed people isn't qualitative research. Um, which demonstrates a clear misunderstanding. Um, so, you know, I think uh, it's important to say that the, the minister was very gracious in replying to my tweet. Um, and I think uh, suggesting that it was not her intention to dismiss. Um, she never blessed up to her guns regarding the sample size. Um, so this is just to illustrate what I feel is a bigger point. Um, I put it to the minister that she misunderstood not only the nature of research of this type, but also the value of it. And, and having read an early draft of Michael's report and being very familiar with Philip's report, um, you know, the value of it is very obvious in the reading of it. Um, and it's a value that's not based on numbers. Um, so I want to talk now about qualitative research with big Q uh, values. Um, and so this for me is about championing, championing the doing of qualitative research as a means of arriving at real, distinctive and meaningful social scientific knowledge, while also within that championing uh, lived experience as a form of knowledge. So to make the case rather than justifying it as an approach, uh, which is something I have often felt the need to do by comparing it to more quantitative approaches, um, I want to deal briefly with what I feel are the strengths of qualitative research as well as some of the misconceptions. So I really, really like this meme. Um, I stole it from Twitter. Uh, I'm not sure who the original creator of it was, but I think it, it kind of really um, captures the, I suppose, stereotypical notions of the differences between quantitative and qualitative research. Uh, quantitative research presents as quite uh, straight-laced, maybe somewhat austere, whereas qualitative research is um, much more complex uh, and particularly are potentially very messy. And so, you know, they do different things and they are different things. And for that reason, they produce different types of knowledge. So qualitative research is not just about data and techniques. Uh, it's about the application of qualitative techniques and values within a qualitative paradigm. So big Q qualitative research can be contrasted with small Q qualitative research, which is the use of specific qualitative data collection and techniques not necessarily within that paradigm. So what does that mean? It means basically that qualitative research with a big Q is not concerned with numbers. It's concerned with understanding people's experiences. So there are arguments which suggest that big Q qualitative research uh, based on lived experience maybe lacks a generalizability factor. Maybe this makes it somewhat less valued. But I think this is something that this critique somewhat misses the point. And big Q qualitative research aims for depth over and above probability and breadth in the sense of um, um, in the sense of the, the kind of complexity of experiences. Um, and actually, you know, there are some uh, arguments in the literature which suggest that uh, small sample sizes are very useful in exploratory qualitative research because they, they allow for um, a very um, a very refined focus. Um, of course, this is then grounded in, in, in um, cognitive literature and other existing research. Just on generalizability in particular, Smith has noted that qualitative research does lack generalizability. There's, there's no getting away from that. But only when we understand generalizability in a very narrow way, only when we understand it in terms of statistical probabilistic generalizability. So this is true, but we're not interested in statistical probabilistic generalizability when we do qualitative work. And we're interested again in complexity. Uh, so empirical materials and qualitative research aim to illustrate depth and breadth, and breadth here meant in the sense of the complexity of phenomena. And it's messy by nature, which means as researchers, we have to impose structure upon it and separating out uh, things that are actually quite intimately intertwined. 
So having kind of made the case for big Pew qualitative research now and, and hopefully kind of demonstrated how it's different to, to small Pew or quantitative approaches, I next want to just talk briefly about lived experience. Um, so there are difficulties with the term lived experience. It's a term that's in common usage. And sometimes when something becomes used very commonly, it begins to lose meaning. Um, and it has been picked up by researchers working in this space. So Macintosh and Wright, for example, have found that the idea of lived experience is both intuitive and useful, but have also been you know, increasingly concerned by its potential to seem vacuous or contradictory. And they asked the question, what is any experience if it's not lived? Ultimately, you know, through documenting the complexity of lived experience as a term of particular meanings in particular contexts, they argue that it, presenting it as a form of knowledge can offer a sharp critical edge and, and can therefore be associated with an empathetic immersion uh, into the lives and concerns of people affected by an involved in policy. And, and I think, you know, having, have, having read an early draft of, of Michael's work and having read this kind of research and been involved in this kind of research uh, over a number of years, um, the value of uh, lived experience as a form of knowledge with a sharp critical edge is very apparent. Um, and it has the potential then to, to affect uh, processes and outcomes. Um, you know, so people like policymakers, um, context creators, managers, but also frontline workers, um, and also importantly, uh, those who are affected by policy who are often disempowered and oppressed groups. So this then captures the efficacy of lived experience as a type of knowledge in terms of its form and effect, empathetic immersion, its potential, it's a potential to affect policymakers, and those whose stories it has the power to transmit, so this is power and, and oppressed groups, in this case, uh, like various siblings. Um, so when you approach it in this way, lived experiences of form and knowledge can be very powerful, particularly when it's translate, transmitted into the vocabulary of those who have actually experienced what they're talking about. Um, so I think that uh, Richard Rorty talks about coming to new forms of simply an understanding uh, when we come to know something of the life history of persons. And I would argue that sympathy and understanding as the building blocks for how we do social policy would seem like a very adequate way to start. So the last thing I want to talk about then is the idea of shared typical. So having made the case for uh, qualitative research, big Q qualitative research as producing valuable uh, forms of knowledge, having made the case for lived experience as being itself a valuable form of knowledge, I now want to talk briefly about how we might strengthen that type of evidence through what uh, I'm referring to as shared typical experience types. And um, so there are loads and loads of examples of research which draws on the lived experiences of people in the context of welfare. And there's lots of them particularly uh, emerging in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, in many of these examples, similar themes, narratives, and descriptions of experiences emerge. So, for example, if we just took my work, Michael's work, and Philip's work as an example, uh, you would find in reading all three uh, that there are many uh, similar uh, narratives and themes and descriptions of experiences. Um, and these constitute what may be called uh, shared typical aspects of lived experience, which are very much less about jurisdictional and procedural differences and much more about the everyday lived realities of person, persons, despite uh, differences in jurisdiction and procedure. So I think this term is really used for the idea of a constellation of motives. Um, and in applying the concept of shared typical and following other uh, work researchers who have worked in this space using big Q qualitative approaches, uh, people like Macintosh and Wright, Wright and Patrick and so on, and they draw on seed right mills and this idea of a constellation of motives as a way to pick out sources of motive or action, which may not be wholly individual or structural. So uh, Macintosh and Wright have argued that social policy as a discipline can and should use lived experience as a window into the shared typical, and I very much uh, agree with that assertion. So Wright and Patrick have taken the concept very, very far, and I think they firmly established it as a very useful lens. And this has been built on by others like Trainer, Patrick, and, and Wynham. Um, and I think at this point, uh, shared typical is starting to come into its own as a lens through which uh, experience types can be aggregated uh, to form, uh, to form uh, an evidence base. Um, and so when you do research and you ground it, not only in the context in which the research was carried out, but also um, in cognitive research and in cognitive literature, um, you're, you're presenting a very strong case and a very strong argument and a very strong evidence base uh, for policy making. 
So I just want to finish by giving uh, two examples. Um, and again, these are these are broadly thematic examples. So I'm not, again, I'm not getting into data here. And I think that you'll be um, you'll be able to pick up on some of uh, what I've been saying here in the context of data in, in presentations to come. There's 30 seconds work. left there, Joe, okay? Uh, just about 30, 30, about 30 seconds left, Joe. Okay, and I'm, I'm coming to a finish now, so I, 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 sh I, sh I won't be much longer. Um, so deservingness is something that came up very strongly um, in the research that I did, but it's also uh, something that you'll see very strongly in the research of uh, colleagues in Ireland, colleagues in the UK, um, and colleagues within the liberal world of welfare in general. Um, so, you know, people that receive welfare are deeply uh, affected by questions of deservingness. Um, and this is something that I would claim is a shared typical experience type because you see it and it's very apparent in other research. And the same thing with how people are affected by welfare conditionality. So I've given a, a you know, I've, I've named a number of sources here and, you know, I'm probably in danger of leaving out many. But if you read this work, you will find that the, 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 the way in which people are affected by welfare conditionality is something that comes through in all of this work. And again, this gives us the sense that this is a shared typical experience type, and this strengthens it as an evidence base for making policy. And so those are just two examples of what I mean by shared typical. Um, so this is where I wrap things up. Uh, why is this important as evidence? Um, well, we might want to ask ourselves, what, what should the basis for social policy be? And I would argue, and I, and I said it earlier, that sympathy, empathy, and understanding as the building blocks of social policy seem like a good place to start. So, you know, why do punitive? Why do restrictive? Why do invasive? Why not do uh, social policy based on sympathy, empathy, and understanding? Um, but to get there, we need to nuance what we mean by generalizability. Um, I think a shared typical understanding of lived experience potentially has implications for how we do social policy in a global world. A holistic evidence base for social policy should include multiple ways of knowing, not just econometric ways of knowing. People's experiences and how they communicate about and understand them is very important. Um, and reporting lived, experiencing, lived experiences and including it as part of a holistic evidence base has the potential to elicit the best aspects of a common humanity. Um, and that's why I think that it's a very important form of research. And that's why I think that this report that we're here to launch today is a really, really important report that makes a really important con contribution to the canon of knowledge uh, of this type. Um, so that's where I leave it. Sorry for going over a little there. Um, and uh, I'll hand over to the next speaker. That's great. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, really interesting. And I think setting the context for the next two presentations um, and, you know, in our minds kind of thinking about what what it means uh, to do qualitative research and the richness that that can bring uh, to our understanding and to the knowledge that's created. So I'll hand over now to uh, Dr. Philip Finn. So just to introduce Philip, uh, Philip is an assistant lecturer here at the Department of Sociology at Maynooth. Uh, his research explores the lived experience and agency of welfare claimants and particularly the complex multi-layered navigation of welfare conditionality. He's a qualitative researcher with a particular interest in creative methodologies. His current research interest is in using feminist social reproduction theory to explore life making of working class communities, including diverse intersecting forms of work and non-work activities in everyday life. So I'll hand over to Philip. Hey, um, thanks very much, Nula, for uh, making me sound great. And I'm going to do my best to disappoint now. Um, so I'm just trying to share my screen. Also, just to, uh, uh, just to echo what Joe was saying about uh, thanks to Michael and everyone for, for organizing this. And uh, thanks to Joe as well for that really great uh, defense uh, um, of, of qualitative research and, and lived experience, which is going to kind of uh, inform what I'm going to do today, where I focus on claimant agency in relation to Irish welfare conditionality and how okay, the spaces they're in and how the different forms of agency that they're involved in are kind of intersect and, and shape one another. 
it's based on on PhD research with 42 um, uh, job seekers in Kildare, 22 men, 12, 20 women and 11 lone parents. And there's me falling into the, the numbers game that, that, that Joe had talked about as well. It's very hard to shake off. Um, so I don't think there's much need really to contextualize any of this stuff, but I've made the slide, so I'm going to go through it quickly. Um, so we can say in the last 10 years that the pathways to work has kind of instigated a new welfare trajectory, intensifying the link between social security provision and work and kind of emphasizing lifelong labor or lifelong attachment to the labor market and based on intensification of work related conditionality, in particular behavioral conditionality through uh, contractualization, progression plans, job search activity, training, education, and the use of sanctions and so on. We're seeing that, uh, as Joe kind of pointed out, a growing, a, a growing literature on, on the kind of lived experience of this in Ireland of, of claimants, you know, and this paper is kind of inserting itself into that, trying to make sense of what type of system is being produced and doing, but doing that through looking at the practices that individuals are, are engaged in at, at, at a street level. Uh, kind of view. So this is a, a very messy slide that I haven't really bothered to, to clean up, so apologies for that, but it's just kind of outlined some of the techniques of, of welfare conditionality that's that's occurring in, in the Irish system, you know, it's focused on, on conduct or behavioural conditionality, you know, we could also include other types of conditionality like Glasson and Clegg do in terms of category and, and circumstances, um, but I'm focused on behavioural conditionality because I think it's attempting to elicit a particular type of behavior, that idea of kind of a good job seeker, you know, that uh, Tom Boland and Ray Griffin talk about and kind of, you know, emphasizing job search activity, you know, active participation in the labor market through education and training and, and, and human capital development, well-being kind of enthusiastic and motivated through all of this and kind of underlined by the idea of work as being an obligation of, of citizenship uh, uh, throughout that. and. Um, Actually, some of the forms that you can see on the side there that are uh, conditionality documents, they're actually my own. So, so you're not getting, um, so you're not only getting academic uh, knowledge here, you're also getting um, some experiential knowledge as well from my own experience. But all of this is kind of situated in and kind of reinforced by, by historical reverberations of, of the work ethic and their it's contemporary deployment alongside moralizing discourses about welfare by political actors uh, across politics and, and the media and wider society as well. So this kind of feeds into how the welfare subject is, is understood as deficient within political discourse and, and, and reflected in policy as well. You know, the implication that they are lazy, work shy. Scroungers are at best, as Larry Mead kind of argues, that they are dutiful but defeated and kind of need a bit of a push in order to 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 start working or perhaps even just that the skills education or whatever are in need of, of, of development but there's always a kind of a sense of deficiency and a need for intervention so claims are kind of generally seen as being deficient and and inactive or not not active or not particularly active in the, in the labor market and in trying to kind of articulate the, the active welfare subject. I'm drawn on the work of, of Sharon Wright and Ruth Lister in particular, who provides this typology for understanding the different forms of, of agency and the different ways that people uh, that are on welfare are, are active. So you've got four quadrants there across uh, the axes, you know, in the top left-hand corner and the kind of everyday personal quadrant is getting getting by, which is kind of the immediate everyday tactics of surviving on, on welfare kind of day to day and week to week. And then below that is kind of a, a more longer term strategy kind of getting out of welfare. So how do people kind of try to get off welfare through education or employment or, or whatever else. And then the top right is kind of pushing into a, a kind of more public political sphere um, or back into the everyday. It's kind of immediate kind of resistant tactics that people might do in uh, in their interactions with, with welfare agencies and below that is um, getting organized kind of more long-term collective kind of organization um, uh, to, to, to fight for your, your interest. Now I'm kind of focusing here on getting by, getting out and getting back out because to be blunt there was very little political organization or collective organization at least around unemployment and welfare in, in the research I, I was doing. Um, so these are just kind of ways to kind of understand the different activities that the people are, are involved in, you know, and 
although there are very kind of real economic, cultural um, policy constraints on claimants' lives, which narrow their possibilities, they are still very active in navigating these spaces and beyond in, term, in terms of trying to meet their own interests and, and needs. And there's a whole range of activities that people are involved in, in reproducing their lives, and including how they interact with welfare ag agencies and, and caseworkers. So, yeah, as I said, in a very immediate sense, there's kind of a whole range of activities that people are involved in kind of surviving and, and, and getting by on, on welfare. And, you know, the overwhelming experience is not a pleasant one. As one participant said to me, it's, it's you know, you, you know, you're not high on the hog while living on welfare and plenty of people kind of uh, um, kind of strain themselves to tell me or, or that, 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 you know, you don't go on holidays to Florida when you're living on welfare, you know, it's not a pleasant experience. And there's quite sophisticated strategies then of kind of budgeting, borrowing, and utilizing extended networks for things like childcare in order to get by just week to week. You know, and there's one woman I spoke to, Sarah, I think when, when, we, when we spoke, she kind of pulled out a, a little red book where she had kind of she talked me through the budgeting that you do where she was able to track every penny that she had from that she was receiving from social welfare where it was going and what she needed in order to pay her bills every week so it's quite often intricate week to week survival you know and that leaves people kind of vulnerable to to shocks of unexpected costs and so on and also while managing all, all of this you're kind of living in and managing with stigma as well people are kind of well aware of how they're perceived in, in society you know and interacting with agencies and caseworkers you know, in wider society through people they meet and political and media discourse as well. And this kind of getting by on welfare, particularly material survival and its vulnerability, is pretty fundamental in shaping interactions with and responses to conditionality, you know, and the kind of rules and obligations about finding work and so on. And I would say one of the kind of most significant things for me when I was doing it was just how muted job searching was as as a strategy for getting out of welfare. So you have a quote there from Nadine at the top, um, who, you know, in her own words, uh, said she she took a, a shitty cleaning job because she, she wanted to get uh, away from Taurus Nua and, and kind of the interactions she was having with them. But this was by and large a kind of a minority. There was only a handful of people who were pursuing employment as a real kind of strategy to get off welfare. And this wasn't because people were lazier that he didn't even uh, or didn't have kind of work histories in the past but you know claimants had had again kind of a, a sophisticated understanding of their place in the labor market you know the about limitations of their age their break in work history education but also the type of work, work that they seen as being available to them which they seen as being kind of insecure low paid and, and unfulfilling so the the vulnerability of moving off the limited but stable security of welfare kind of into such work and how it interacted um, with other welfare concerns such as housing and medical cars was, was quite a serious issue i think so the strategies that really kind of for getting off of welfare pri primarily are uh, were organized around education and kind of develop attempting to develop human capital um for for better work down the road so it was kind of instilled with a sense of a sense of hope that that maybe if you do this now things down the road will, will, will get better you'll be able to get a job that 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 you like that is good and is financially kind of feasible as well for for survival and i think kind of the different forms of agency across getting by and getting out of welfare help to situate um, claimants as experts of their own circumstances needs and interests which can shape the immediate tactics then that of getting back at the system that they're engaging with at, at, at everyday kind of street level interactions. And this kind of took different forms as, as, as well. You can have these dramaturgical performances or kind of a, a tactical mimicry of the good job seeker, you know, which is what Nick in the first quote is engaging in. Nick was a man in his 50s who I think had an anthropology degree. And he's kind of performing this feigned compliance to, to welfare conditionality. Um, you know, and, and, and kind of the rules and obligations about job searching and the provision of evidence and so on. And kind of in that example, I think pushing it to pushing the credulity of it to, to its limits in a sense, which kind of underlines something important about it as well, that these performances were fragile and contingent and kind of require an ongoing and, and, and repeated performances as well. And then you had instances of, of kind of impression management, you know, where you kind of situate the caseworker as the knowledge and skills and 
there would be a performance of, of, of gratitude that kind of maintains the process as worthwhile and helpful even when you don't believe it to be so. And then there was examples of, of, of working cash in hand while claiming and other kind of instances of subverting eligibility rules around welfare as well. And there's a very kind of spe obvious species, species reading to this, I think, where you just think, oh, these are all obviously kind of work shy scroungers and that what they need is more conditionality and more sanctions. But I, I think it's important to ground this in the wider context and particularly the participants' self-understanding of their situation and the threat of low pay and how that intersects with other welfare provisions that they're in receipt of, you know, and kind of threatens the, the limited safety uh, that's provided by, by, by welfare payments as well. And with all of this, I kind of draw on James C. Scott's got a concept of everyday resistance, you know, where we can kind of understand these as, as kind of informal, hidden, individualized tactics of resistance to the logic of, of conditionality and the type of work that's available, because quite often these were kind of grounded in general critiques of, about unfairness and, and, and inequality in, in, in Ireland as well. So what does that tell us about the, the system uh, that's in Ireland? Um, so I think it kind of, this kind of plunges claimants into a, an absurd experience, you know, where they're kind of placed on this bureaucratic carousel because conditionality in many ways is, at the street level is superficial. It's kind of operating as a bureaucratic procedure that's kind of concerned primarily with box ticking and kind of going through the process, going through the motions. And there's a strong rhetoric not matched by a strong rhetoric of conditionality that's not really matched by the implementation. And that in itself kind of gives the space for claimants to kind of subvert the, the whole experience through the dramaturgical performances that they're doing. Um, but this isn't necessarily um, experienced as a good thing for claimants because they misrecognize welfare originally as being a kind of a caring institute offering support and, and assistance, you know, where what emerges then is an inability or an unwillingness of caseworkers to offer what is perceived as genuine engagement that addresses their needs and concerns. Uh, and claimants spoke uh, quite often about kind of, you know, their financial situations, mental health, caring responsibilities and so on, not being taken into account in conversations. Um, and even when it came to work, the, the quite often said, a little practical assistance with caseworkers just primarily interested in kind of going through the process and going through the forms, um, you know, with, with little actual help about, about finding jobs and so on. And I think then there's a kind of a misalignment of, of, of interests, you know, um, where sometimes caseworkers were quite protective of, of claimants and, and kind of shielded them from sanctions, for example. Other times they were imposing kind of conditionality and, 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 and a threat of, of sanctions. But by and large, it, it was kind of primarily a neglect toward the interests and needs of claimants through a focus on, on bureaucratic procedure. And um, that claimants thought the, the, their kind of circumstances and needs weren't taken into account. Um, so from, I think there's not a, ten, a, a punitive tendency in the system as there is in other jurisdictions, for example, the UK. But what we get instead is a kind of an institutional indifference, which kind of frustrates the agency of claimants and quite often drives them into those dramaturgical performances that they do in order to protect their own interests, needs and, and, and circumstances, which they see as not really being taken into the process. But at the same time, there's an implicit recognition of control here and that conditionality and sanctions kind of structure, structure the encounters. They're generated of dramaturgical performances, you know, that you then need to meet this superficial engagement on its own terms through feigned compliance and, and, and impression management. Sorry, Philip, just 30 seconds left there. Oh, yeah, I'm at last slide. Okay, great. Um, so I think this kind of indicates the limitations of supply side, and I would be pretty pessimistic or critical of any kind of sense of reforming labour activation because I think the notion that people are deficient is built into it, and whether that's situating people as as kind of lazy scroungers in need of the stick to get to work or underskilled, uneducated human capital that kind of need to, to be developed, it's kind of the labour market and capitalist work that that designates people as as deficient, you're de deficient in the eyes of. Of, of, of capitalism, I suppose. And I think it's important to kind of, you know, uh, as, as Kremen suggested, you know, to recognize that the big boss will never love you in, in the sense that we can never be employable enough. It's always kind of shifting ground. 
Um, there's always new credentials, new, new skills to be attained. You can never be quite sure what it is that, that will get you the job or whether you're even overqualified. And I think one thing which kind of struck me was how claimants talked about moving from agent, agency to agency through the welfare system. And each time they would kind of wind up at a new agency, the caseworker would insist that the CV was formatted wrong. As if, the, the, as if finding the correct structure would somehow like unlock the magical employability and solve the problem. So I think there's a greater problem in terms of the, the kind of dominance, works dominance within welfare and how we think about welfare now in terms of welfare to work, you know, which kind of elides a lot of the activities that people are engaged in and kind of uh, a lot of other forms of work that, that, that people engage in in their everyday life and kind of take joy from as well. And that's kind of, a lot of the quotes are just some of the examples that, that would turn up my research that I put on the screen. So I'll finish on that, the positives of unemployment um, uh, before I get even more ranty. So I, I'll finish there. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. That was, uh, that was great. And I hope um, some of you got the opportunity to read some of those really important quotes uh, that Philip presented. Um, and the session is recorded, so um, you might like to look back over those. And I do uh, encourage you, please, uh, to send us in your comments or observations or questions uh, as you're listening to the speakers. So uh, our final speaker uh, is Dr. Michael McGann, um, a Marie Curie Research Fellow here at the Department of Sociology and the uh, Social Science Institute at Maynooth. Uh, he has been a great colleague for the last two years. Um, so Michael is presenting his research. Um, his main interests are really in street level bureaucracy and welfare governance, but he's got a particular focus on issues related to welfare to work and marketization of public employment services. Um, he's the lead investigator on the Governing uh, Activation in Ireland project and is a guest editor with Professor Mary Murphy on a recent special issue of administration on Ireland's activation turn 10 years on. So I'll hand over to you now, Michael. Thank you very much, Nuala. Um, I'll just share my screen here now. Um, and thank you very much to, to you all for coming along this afternoon. Uh, I know it's we're getting towards Christmas and it's a Friday and um, it, it's a very busy time of year to people. And I'd just like to thank uh, so to Philip and, and Joe for two very stimulating presentations so far and for Nula's great chairing of this session. She's been a great colleague of the two years I've been here at Maynooth and the wonderful work in the background being done by Orla and Anne from Muzi and also our two discussants, Breed O'Brien from the Irish National Organisation of the Unemployed and Anne-Marie McGarren from, uh, fr from NESC, the National Economic and Social Council, both of whom have done important work in this space themselves in terms of research on uh, people's experiences of activation and employment services. And I also, first and foremost, really should have started out with thanking the job seekers that participated in, in, in the research that I'm going to talk about now. And I know some of them are on the call here um, th this, this afternoon. Uh, the very generously gave of their time and shared their experiences with me. And I do hope that I've been faithful and done justice to those experiences in my report. Um, and Joe's already talked about how the problem of lived experience itself is kind of slightly problematic. I mean, I'm no real expert on qualitative research with um, unemployed people or the lived experience of welfare to work in the in, in the way that Joe and, uh, and Philip are and the, the extensive work that Anne-Marie McGarren's done as well in this kind of space. I've This is sort of one component of a larger project of, or body of work that I've been doing over the last two years on what is activation like at the street level in Ireland at the coalface in terms of the different employment services are that are out there and I've been focusing in my research on the employment services for people who are long term unemployed, specifically job path and local employment services and these are all only one small component of the suite of employment services that are there there's obviously intrio job clubs do important work as well and employability services but why do I care about the difference between local employment services and job path is because I'm interested in marketization and contracting out and the role that that plays in either stimulating innovation in service delivery uh, or what the kind of effects are in the way that employment services are delivered. So this work that I'm presenting here builds on a earlier wave of research that, that some of you may have come and heard me talk about in May, which was surveying the frontline staff in local employment services and job path and also doing interviews with those staff as, as, as well. So it's 
I'm trying to triangulate different pieces of research to kind of fit uh, uh, together an overall sort of more comprehensive picture of what's going on. And all of that research is available on the project website, which is activationinireland.wordpress.com. So this report that I'm going to talk about today, as well as the previous report on understanding frontline employment services, which was the um, frontline staff's perspective. So what I'm talking about today is based on interviews that I did between April and August, late April to early August, with 35 former or current clients of either local employment services or job path. Um, and that's just, you can see, the kind of characteristics of the people that took part in the study. Uh, I wanted a mix of current and former clients because I wanted to get a picture of what frontline delivery was like pre-pandemic when um, the mutual obligations uh, and sanctioning environment was in place and whether there were kind of differences in the kind of pre-COVID and post-COVID experiences of, of activation, which I talk a little bit about in the report, but, no, but, but, but I won't really get a chance to touch on today. Uh, and of the 35 people I interviewed, 31 had experiences of job path and both job path providers and 10 had experiences of local employment services organizations uh, and a number of those 10 people had also been participants at, 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 in job path at some point as well but what I want to what I want to highlight here is the number of people who had multiple experiences of job path and this is I think a really important thing that comes out from the research is the extent to which we've got a system that kind of cycled people not only through multiple rounds of job path but from job path, to local employment services, back to intro, back to job path again. And there's a kind of uh, feeling of kind of being spun round and round continuously from short-term intervention to short-term intervention. So we can see here uh, of the 31 people that had participated in job path, 15 of them had been through two rounds of job path. Uh, and a significant number of them had been through either three or four rounds of job path. So eight of the people that I would have interviewed, that was the case for. Um, so this is the quote kind of illustrating that. So that's when that's then that finished the first round of job path. And then there's the six month cooling off period before you go to be contact again. And then back to the same office in the same provider. And the only thing that really changes is the person's case manager or the person's advisor. And I think that's an important thing that we need to highlight is uh, just how much duplication and repetition there is in the current system of welfare to work in, that we have now. And the other thing that came out very strongly in the interviews, and it's been really highlighted as well in the INO, in the INOU's research on their project on um, their employment services research project, where they had focus groups of people who'd been through intro, who'd been through local employment services, who'd been through job path, was the communication of the communications towards job seekers and what those communications convey convey about the nature of their participation. So Philip's meant and, and Joe have both talked about conditionality uh, and the kind of behavioral obligations there are to participate in employment services. What we don't really see in, in, in Ireland so much is any act is it is a big stick approach to conditionality where people actually are frequently sanctioned in the way that they would be in the UK uh, or, or in the Australian system that I have a lot of experience of. But we see the threat of this happening to people as being ever present. And this I would argue, and certainly talk about in the report, really, really colors people's experiences of, of the whole system of welfare to work or the whole employment, their whole experience of public employment services. So while very few of the people that I interviewed actually had been sanctioned or penalty rated themselves at any point, they frequently commented again and again had there's this sentence in black letters on every letter about if you don't engage, if you don't participate, your payments will be affected. And Porik here goes on to talk about the impression that the, this leaves with him in terms of how it affects his self-esteem. It gives you the impression that you're naturally inclined to be lazy and stupid. And he doesn't really feel that he's lazy and inclined, but if somebody kept telling that, it might have an effect as, on his self-esteem. You're lazy, you're stupid. If we don't kick, keep kicking you, you won't even get out of bed in the morning. That's the impression you get. So what's the kind of psychological uh, damage that bolding this particular component of the letter about engaging in job path or local employment services uh, has on, on people's sense of self-esteem. And I mentioned that Ireland isn't a particularly sanctions oriented system, but the number of people who have been penalty rated has grown consistently year on year up until 2018 when it sort of tailed off, uh, hitting a peak of uh, just, just, under just over 13,000. 
But at the same time, the proportion of people on the live register has also almost halved over this period. So in proportional, the number of people on the live register, I should say. So in proportional terms, the rate of, of job seekers who are being sanctioned is growing considerably year on year, although now we're beginning to see a reverse. But this compulse, the compulsiveness of activation gives rise to a form of participation that's really just about compliance rather than engagement, I, I think. And then what we get from this kind of activation orientated approach is people participating out of the sake, for the sake of not wanting their payments to be affected, but not, and this kind of gives rise to this kind of mental kind of disconnection from the system and this kind of indifference about the, the system because of the way in which participation is being communicated and conveyed to them and the conditions in which they've been in, required to engage in employment services. And the point of participation becomes to play along or to go through the motions and Philip talked about a tick in the box exercise. And that came through a lot in the interviews that I, I, I did with people. Obviously I'd sit through the training uh, that they thought I needed. I knew I didn't need it, but you know, tick a box, because as I say, most of the people uh, there were, who were in the workshops were in the same frame of mind, just get it done. Um, because as I say, uh, just get it done. If there's any workshops, you kind of do what you have to do. To, so you're seen to be looking and applying for work and you obey by the rules and you comply with the rules. You don't like it, but why make you more, your life more complicated? I would just go in there once a month and do whatever had to be done. You see this coming through again and again, because if you, if you don't, you, you, do, you don't do it, you lose your payment. So are people participating because they think that the employment services that they're receiving are quality employment services that are going to actually be of benefit and substantial uh, gain for them in two terms of progressing them towards employment? Or are they just participating out of the sense of compulsion and it's a merely a compliance, an exercise in administrative compliance rather than an exercise in employability um, uh, 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 as such? Uh, and then I, one thing that I was particularly interested in is how people experienced, experienced the differences between uh, the advisors that they dealt with in the in the respective employment services, because that was an issue that came through very strongly in the first wave of research that I did was that there were quite significant differences between the people that work as mediators in the local employment services or between the people who work as mediators uh, or as advisors, I should say, in job path. And I want to emphasize that overwhelmingly interviewees were very positive about their um, and case managers or their mediators or advisors as people in terms of, you know, they were very nice to them. They treated them generally with quite with dignity and respect. They were friendly, they were warm towards them. Uh, so they had very positive things to say about case managers, what I would say demeanor, their kind of interactive style with job seekers. But then when it came to their level of experience or their level of skills or qualifications or competencies to actually give them advice about returning to the labor market, that was a different kettle of fish and a different story altogether. And they commented, and the more so, it, this has to be said in the case of the job path staff rather than the local employment services staff. And the, the, you know, they pointed out that a lot of the advisors that they were dealing with were people who had just come off the dole themselves, or they were people who were former salespeople. Uh, you know, this quote from Frank, I think, is illustrative of she was a nice woman, but her level of knowledge it wasn't really suitable for the job. So they really draw attention to this distinction over and over again. And the other key issue was the rate of churn or turnover in the staff that people were dealing with. So 11 of the 31 people that had experience of job path had dealt with at least two advisors over their period of participation. But in seven of those cases, they had dealt with three or more advisors. And we had one person who had dealt with five different advisors in the space of five months. And, and that's a problem that's been highlighted in, in, in earlier research as well. But again, it keeps coming up, up again and again. And you see that in the quotes here. I know they rotate staff through staff very quickly. I'd have the same advisor for maybe a couple of weeks and then I'd be on to, to somebody else. Um, and I wanna come on then to, okay, well, what's the actual kind of model of employment support that people are actually receiving in these, in, in these different employment services? Uh, and what sort of emerges in the findings uh, on job path is this is a kind of fourfold component of employability support that's based on first and foremost, an emphasis on job search monitoring, not necessarily giving people set targets or numbers of specific jobs that they have applied for week on week or every two weeks, but at least, and in some cases there are, but a key point of each meeting is to review the jobs that people are, are, are applying for every week. And that's sort of the key focus of the engagement is just really around monitoring job searching. But then it can take a more aggressive form 
of what I call tree shaking, which is something that happened to a number of people, which is where they're brought in on a, potentially on a weekly basis for a period of time to engage in job searching on the office computers. Uh, and this quote from Sarah kind of illustrates this. Every now and again, he'd get me to sit on a computer for half an hour. He'd have lots of tabs open. And I'd say, I've already looked at that. I've looked at that. I had to sit there for half an hour, basically, so he could check a box. And this kind of approach of tree shaking was kind of universally derided by the participants in the study as well. Uh, combined then occasionally with internal workshops, these were really polishing activities about giving people uh, training in groups on how you might write a CV or how you might write a cover letter. And this would be kind of a standard pro forma approach to the nature of employment support that people received. And then in more occasional cases, they would be given some sort of very uh, immediate job entry focused training around gaining per licenses or permits that might be needed, such as forklift licenses or safe passes for the kind of opportunities that are open to people in the immediate labor market around them with the kind of otherwise the skills that are that, that they've already got, rather than a kind of bigger ticket piece of upskilling or training. And that was a frequent criticism among the interviews was the lack of support for training and reskilling in a kind of more substantive way that would be leading to a kind of longer term re uh, change of career, for instance, or leading to longer term progression or mobility in the labor market. And the impression seemed to be of a very kind of one size fits all or standardized approach to the employment support that they were receiving in terms of the types of jobs that they were being encouraged and directed towards being often very low wage entry level jobs that didn't seem to fit with people's kind of experience or skills, but also in terms of the pitch of the training workshops that they would be put forward to or the pitch of the jobs that they would be directed to that really they were kind of perceived as being vacancies or, or positions that were kind of more suited for people who had just come out of school with kind of no work experience whatsoever, whereas many of the interviewees that I spoke to had extensive experience of employment beforehand and they're just going through a disruption in their life. Uh, and they felt that this was also the case um, for other people too, that they, they were familiar with on the program as, uh, as well. Although there were, I have to say, a couple of instances a couple of cases where people really did praise the, the, the support that they received uh, and particularly from certain case managers that were really celebrated as uh, pointing them towards a lot larger questions about rethinking the direction of their career that they wanted to go into and this comment from michelle is talking about that she was encouraged to retrain in community development work by her advisor at one of the job path agencies but it was kind of like the exception that sort of seemed to prove the rule and that was the rare kind of experience amongst people and then coming on to the les um and i'm going to sort of finish up in a moment here uh, there was a perception that local employment services gave people more options to look at, particularly in terms of work experience programs like community employment or TUS uh, schemes, uh, and also potentially further or higher education. The, the kind of transitions to education were something that would be considered more by the local employment services staff than uh, by job path staff. So this is a comment from Jenny, who's talking about how she worked in retail for many years, but then she was encouraged um, to uh, think about going and studying a degree in adult education. And then she's since completed that degree and has gone on to work in that field as well. Um, and this comment again, that they really feel that education is as good as job seeking. Um, and that came through in several of the comments. And of the sort of 10 people that I that had experience of local employment services, three of them had actually gone from local employment services into studying a degree at college. And that's what they were supported to, as part, to do as part of their progression. And the other key thing was the community employment and two schemes. This was another frequent uh, avenue of progression or avenue of moving in the longer term from welfare to work that uh, participants in local employment services were encouraged to consider uh, very much so. That was kind of my the evidence in my, in my, my sort of research. And I think that probably also is to do with the fact that community employment services and two schemes are also administered by local development companies in many cases. So it makes information sharing uh, very easy between the services and kind of motivates and inclines local employment services staff towards considering community employment or considering TUS as options for their clients, despite the fact that often they won't help them achieve immediate um, employment targets. Uh, and then I guess, while the local employment services staff does 
seem to be giving people a kind of wider range of options to consider as to how they might want to move on with their lives, particularly around community employment, around further or higher education. There wasn't actually much of an emphasis on supporting people to achieve immediate vacancies in the labor market around them. And there was very little evidence actually of any of the, the participants in local employment services that I interviewed being referred to any vacancies. The emphasis actually seemed to be on encouraging them to think about upskilling and retraining and gaining work experience rather than thinking about, okay, how can we move them into work uh, as quickly as possible? And that may be an issue that local employment services staff have to consider in terms of not everybody might want to return to education or want to return to work experience. And what are, what are we doing to actually uh, equip people and help them towards uh, immediate vacancies in their locality and their labor market? So just to kind of fi finish off- 30 seconds our... there, Michael. Perfect. Okay. Great. And this is the last slide with a conclusion. I think this kind of very much reiterates what we found in the first wave of research with frontline staff. The job path does seem to be geared towards a more work first model of activation that's very much about job search monitoring with some kind of polishing activities and some polishing support around that. And it's quite an intensive model of activation. The local employment services is a lighter touch model of activation. It's a bit less formalized and less structured in terms of assessment tools that are used by staff in terms of how progression plans are development are developed with job seekers, but it seems to be very much anchored towards work experience and education rather than work per se, and rather than immediate labor market attachment. And that certainly came through. Uh, but I would also just say that I think activation employment services seem to be primarily experienced as generic rather than coercive in Ireland. They're kind of neither male male malevolent nor benign, although they can be malevolent, malevolent or benign in, in particular instances, but that it's kind of an indifference rather than a coerciveness that seems to be the kind of predominant experience. So I'll leave it there. That's great, Michael. Thanks so much for all that. And I'm sure I, I could have let you go on and on. So uh, I'd highly recommend uh, you all to read Michael's report uh, if you get a chance full of uh, really great richness uh, that comes from qualitative research. Um, so rather than me commenting all, on all that, I'd like to introduce our first discussant. Uh, so Breed O'Brien, um, Head of Policy and Media at the Irish National Organization for the Unemployed. Uh, and she plays a key role in formulating and developing INOU policy on unemployment, social welfare, and the development of an inclusive and equitable labour market. Uh, Breed works with colleagues on behalf of the INOU uh, in the community and voluntary sector on issues of socioeconomic justice and is one of the community and voluntary pillar representatives on the National Economic and Social Council, as well as being a member of the uh, Labour Market Council. So I'll hand over to you, Breed, uh, about seven or eight minutes or so. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Nuala, and thanks to Joe uh, uh, and Philip uh, and Michael for their presentations. Plenty of food for thought. What I thought I would start off with is a, is a, a quote from the Economic Recovery Plan, which was published back in the summer, in which it says, an increased focus will be placed on building an inclusive society and labor market with greater emphasis on good quality employment, increasing participation, and reducing barriers as the economy recovers, ensuring the benefits of the recovery are widely shared. Now that certainly is a sentiment that I feel, yeah, sounds good, be great, wonderful, if it could be delivered on. And then listening to, you know, Michael and Philip in terms of their research and the work that they've done with people and their experiences of the service more recently, what strikes me very much is what that quote says, you know, we ought to be about and what people's experiences of are, there's a huge gap. Um, I was again struck very much by Joe's, you know, uh, 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 presentation and that kind of call for the research into lived experience being valued. I suppose research into lived experience is what we as an organization do. We kind of have a particular model that we have used for many years. We used it in, in the research that, that Michael referenced when we looked at 
the experience of people once the Department of Social Protection acquired the National Employment Service from FOSS and introduced, uh, re reconfigured it and then became it all became intro. We called it the intro model. Initially, we did the work uh, looking at people who've been short term unemployed and their experience of intro. We then, the plan was to look at their experience if they had been long-term unemployed of intro and then we discovered that intro had no intention of engaging with people who are long-term unemployed at that stage the referrals were out to the local employment service and regrettably they didn't leave the employment service do work as they had worked they again uh, it kind of insisted that they used the intro model and then once job path was rolled out we also uh, did research uh, through that Following on from that, we had a national conference. And then out of all of that, we, 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 we drew out what we feel a quality public employment service ought to be. Um, and as I was listening to the three speakers, I was kind of going, you know, you know, sort of in some ways, kind of what, what ought to be an integral part of our employment service sounds almost so idealistic, but I feel at the same time, it's something that we have to keep calling for and calling for and calling for, particularly now at the moment when there's potential that a lot of this could change. And we'll be very concerned that the change is not, it is going in the wrong direction. And that many of the experiences that Philip and Michael have, have outlined and, 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 and documented and captured and indeed, Joe, through his own work, has as well, um, will be further, uh, 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 will regrettably become a, an even bigger part of people's experience. Uh, so we really do feel it needs to be a public employment service that's open to all. They reconfigured it around one payment, the job seekers payment. To, on that payment, conditionality has always applied. In the Irish context, it's been called genuinely seeking work. And that's applied. And you really cannot have a public employment service that will lead to an inclusive labour market that's designed around a service that effectively is an activation service, an engage or else service. And previous speakers have highlighted the negative impact that has on people. Um, it is not creating the type of service that we would like to see. So a service that really is open to everybody and that everybody is free to engage with and to use when they need it, be it to address their unemployment, their underemployment, if they wish to go from being part-time employed to being full-time employed, if they are in low-paid jobs and want to improve the, 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 their, um, their employment options and get better employment, more sustainable employment. We have lots of issues coming at us as a labour market. The full impact of Brexit has not played out. There's digital change. Uh, you know, that there's the whole just transition and climate change issues coming at us as well so we really do need if we are to indeed have an inclusive labor market if we are to come out of this crisis and other crises that are coming at us in a way that leads to a more inclusive and equitable society then we need a public employment service that's playing an active role in that and really supporting people to access a good and decent job so integral to that needs to be clear communication a positive approach proactive supports good relationships and networking, cooperation, um, building links with employers, provision of clear, accurate and timely information. I mean, we, we cannot, Philip highlighted and it's a big issue for us, our current welfare provisions are inadequate. It's very striking the difference they set pop at and the rest of working age payments are at. Um, and so people struggle to survive, they, 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 I mean, thought Philip's example of the woman who has her red notebook that she keeps to manage her money, like the, the way people do manage to survive really is extraordinary. And a bump in the road could be a, a big event that's coming up near Christmas. It might not necessarily be something negative. It could be something that a lot of people look on as positive, but if you diddly squat, it becomes a negative. So that whole need for good clear and accurate information so that if people are making that welfare to work journey they will be better off that they're not been asked to kind of walk off a cliff 
or to go in the door and under the welcome mat, there's a big massive hole into which they will disappear. So we really do need to make sure that we have services that are supportive of people, that staff skills are developed and appreciated for those that have them and valued, that the resources are put into the services so that they really do provide people with a good public employment service. And key to that, you know, our, our key values and principles need to under, uh, underpin that. Belief in the potential and capacity of the person. I really was struck by Michael's talking about, you know, people were being sent back to job path and sent back to job path and sent back to job path. Like the image that goes through my head is one of those revolving doors that people just kind of are in and back out again and in and back out again. And that's not good for people. It's not good for their health and well-being you know, and it's also not a good use of resources. We, we should be putting those resources to better use so that people really feel that what is an offer, that what they're being supported to do will really make a difference to them. So that if where they feel they are at and where potential jobs are at, that people feel they will be given the supports to undertake the, undertake the necessary education training to help them get that good job. Respect and dignity needs to be an integral part of it. Informed choice is a biggie for us. People really need to feel that they are being given choices and that they can exercise that choice. The use of agency, Philip used in, 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 used in his work, that people really feel, I mean, there was one, one case in, in Michael's report that he had that I really thought, my God, you know, oh, I see you, Nuala. Okay, Grant, <laughs> okay. I, 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 I'm almost there, I promise. It was basically people been asked in one of those group sessions what time you got up in the morning? I thought, jeepers, you're, it's a room full of adults and you're treating them like juveniles. I mean, that's not on. You know, we need, and we've, we, we, we as a, 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 other, other policies are, are around quality employment and, and, and that. So we really do need to engage with people as adults. You know, people talk about engaging with employers. Well, then if employers will use the public employment service and look to the live register, and others on welfare payments as a potential, you know, as, as potential employees and welcome employees. But we need a good a, 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 an employment service that really works so that people who go for the jobs are going for jobs that they want to do, that they really would like to be do, that they feel, yeah, this is the job for me. This is the job I want to do. We get that piece right. Then more employers will go, oh, Actually, yeah, you know, that's where we go to kind of that. And we create a win-win and we, we, we really support people, you know, to, to make, to, 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 to move forward. So that whole really working in partnership with the person. Co-design is a, is a, is a term people use now. That, that's really important. Working in partnership with other organizations, including education training providers, be they community-based or statutory agencies, and then actively promoting equality and social inclusion. This is absolutely critical. And all of this needs to be in, underpinned by, enabled by an ethos of a continuous professional development, effective recruitment and good management. So we really do need to try and create those win-wins. And thank you very much, Lula. And I'm, I'll now shut up. <laughs> Thanks so much, Breed. Uh, great. And some really interesting points as well there between it was struck me the, the kind of just turning up, you know, to tick a box versus all that you've now said around a kind of a quality uh, service for people and how they might engage uh, with that uh, differently and how it might help them to have better outcomes. Um, so finally, uh, we'll go to uh, Dr. Anne-Marie McGarren, uh, who is a policy analyst with the National Economic and Social Council and co-author of NESC's research report on low work intensity households. So you're very welcome, Emery. Many thanks, Nuala. And it's great to get the opportunity today to hear these presentations and read the reports and find out more about what has happened in the area of activation since myself and my colleague, Helen Johnston, carried out our research on jobless households four years ago in NESC. So that research took a 360 degree view of the position of these households by talking to them and also to the service providers they were engaging with and to policymakers making policy that influenced them. Job path had just opened then, so we were able to find out a little bit about people's interaction with it, but not to the extent that Philip and Michael have been able to. Um, I have to say, however, that it seems that little has changed 
Um, some things are very similar to what we found in the NESC study. For example, the superficial engagement with job seekers. Um, you know, some of what we've heard today talked about how you know the engagement seems to be driven by filling in forms on the computer. And one person we interviewed um, called it speed dating, which I thought was a really great description. You know, that like this short, sharp engagement that doesn't go into any depth. Um, I think very strongly what comes up in this research still is the theme of fitting into our box, you know, intro or the intro processes want people to fit into their box or the box that they have decided somebody should fit into. And that really comes up in terms of asking people to apply for jobs they're not interested in, or at the time we did the research, there was much more emphasis on courses, unemployment numbers were much higher, so I think that may have been a reason why but many people told us about doing courses that they weren't interested in. So it's really that issue around agency, just such a strong lack of agency in so many key areas, um, which, you know, you can question how effective that use of public funding is. Um, also, we can see that a lot of supports aren't really tailored. Um, NESC has really talked about this a lot in the Developmental Welfare State Study about how important it is to have universal services that can be tailored to meet people's needs. but you know, we can we heard about some examples of that, but there are many other examples where it doesn't seem to happen. Another thing that doesn't have to be doesn't seem to have changed is very little upskilling, and instead, still this emphasis on mandatory entry level certification um, as training. And to be honest, I'd hesitate to call this training. I really think it's kind of like an entry level piece of paperwork. Um, and then the focus on getting into low level employment as soon as possible. Um, but, you know, in the NEST study, we did find people who, you know, really wanted that employment. So it kind of depends on where, where you are um, and what, you know, what fits in with what you want. Um, there's some things then that have developed, but in the same direction since we did the NESC research. So in our study, we found that people didn't know what a personal progression plan was. And now it seems that they have heard what it is about it, but they're not clear what it is. So it's still something that they don't own. And it's still a piece of paper they sign to get their benefits and it doesn't stand out as something that they engage with. And another thing that's new here is people being called to job path because they're in part-time work. And we didn't come across that, but of course, the fact that part-time work doesn't fit well into our unemployment benefit system is new. This, I suppose, is just another manifestation of it. And it's something I would really love to see more focus on, you know, the world is changing. So many people do part-time work, you know, how, how is it that we can't fit that into our welfare system? But of course, during COVID, we did fit it in. So it is possible to do that. Um, I think a difference is that, you know, your study found that job path wasn't really linking people to employers, uh, Michael, but when we were doing our research, the one job path organization that we did engage with, they were linking people to employers. So that seems to be new. Um, I think there are some positive policy takeaways from what you found, though, for example, that the experience of job path was helpful for some people, although it was only a small number. And we can see some things that I know, Nudo, you focused on for a long time, the skilled caseworker, one to one work and the tailored approach, which really worked for people. Um, so how can we have more of that? I think the uh, lack of caseworkers skilled in activation um supports is really an important issue that's come up in the work and something that we would need to combat the importance of work experience for people i think is good something to work on more of it as well um like breed i'm just thinking about you know how can people access these services um i did wonder you know could you not have people voluntarily applying to go to job path because some people want that kind of focus on getting into employment as fast as possible um, it's very important to them. And I want finally to return to Joe's such interesting outline of the importance of lived experience as an evidence base in policy making. I really agree and I think triangulation of research methods, you know, using both quantitative and qualitative to show um, different aspects of the same issue is so important. And you might be interested in the Department of Taoiseach's work at the moment on adopting a well-being approach to public policy. And this is a program for government commitment that wants to have a more balanced focus on progress, um, less of a focus on the economy and more on society and environment. And the government published a report on their approach to this in July. 
and they state that the well-being approach is fundamentally about making people's lives better by better understanding people's lived experience. So it's a key part of their vision for the well-being approach, and there are multiple references to the importance of people's lived experience in the government's report. If you want to look at that more, there are links to that report on NESC's website. If you go to nest.ie and to the work programme and then the wellbeing section, you'll find links to the government's report on this. So on that basis, there should be a much better understanding of the type of lived experience research you've done, Joe, and hopefully appetite to use it. Now, obviously, there's a gap between what's written and what's done, but I hopefully we can see here an opening up and a greater shared understanding on this issue, which is something I think is really important to move more into policy. And I hope that the experience of COVID um, has really helped to put a better real focus on implementing this. So thanks very much for the very interesting uh, few hours. Much, uh, Marie. Um, yeah, really important point about the uh, the well-being uh, approach to public policy. And I think, uh, it would be interesting to look at um, the, the three speakers uh, research, you know, within that context and just see um, how, how it matches up. And absolutely, I mean, my own research would be very much about looking at that, the well-being outcomes uh, for people as they go through these services. So uh, an interesting time. So I don't know if any of the speakers want to uh, respond back to the respondents. We have a few minutes. We do have some comments. Uh, not very many questions. So if anyone would like to send in a question, we'd be delighted uh, to, to put it to the speakers. So Michael, I don't know if you want to. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll happily yeah. come in. Um, and thank you, Anne-Marie and Breed, for those, um, again, very thought-provoking remarks. Uh, and just those of you who've got questions, the, the Q&A function on the bottom of your screen, you can pop them into. Uh, and I think there's, you know, so many important issues. I mean, the well-being budget. I mean, it's in, uh, the well-being approach is interesting. New Zealand have tried to introduce this idea of the first well-being budget, um, building on kind of that approach. And they've emphasised a lot in their approach to policy about co-design that Bree talked about too. And I think that's really an important uh, model that we need to go to go down. And a sort of qualitative research kind of feeds into that to some extent by giving people by giving um, service users uh, a degree of visibility and voice in a way that we don't see in, in quantitative research, but it still doesn't go far enough in terms of empowering them to actually have a say over how services are delivered uh, and designed and could be bettered and improved. I think that's where the work of the INOU is really, really important in, in doing that, but we need to kind of do that more at a, at a, at a more macro level, I think, um, in, in, in the country, and particularly around this issue of personali personalization and tailoring. I mean, we know in the kind of the community that does research on welfare to work programs for people who are long term unemployed, that that's so and so important that we have personalized, individualized employment services because people don't fit into the boxes that Incho or whatever service might like to fit them into. And unfortunately, what we're seeing again and again in the research is what we seem to be getting. Uh, with the kind of activation model and with the kind of uh, very outcomes orientated performance based activation model is standardization and routinization of the services that are delivered. Now, unfortunately, here they're not so coercive as in, in, in other countries, but it is still this kind of are we interested in just reducing the numbers on the live register or actually we're we interested in, in, in well being? And in, and in career progression, like Bree talked about, and not only not only thinking about people on the RIVE register, but thinking about people with disabilities, thinking about people in work already, and then how could kind of employment services be repurposed uh, to promote those kind of progressions as well, which would be good for the society as a whole as well. Um, but we kind of have moved in this very low hanging fruit orientation, unfortunately, over the last five years or so, I would, I, I would say. Um, so I don't know if, I mean, that analogy, the personal progression plans is another interesting one. I mean, I think people were aware of their personal progression plans, but at the same time, uh, at least among people I spoke, there was an enormous confusion about what I would sort of describe as client assessment and, you know, you know, going through an assessment process to determine people's needs and actually formulating a personal progression plan. So 
often there was an equivalence among the people I spoke to between the process of being asked a battery of standardized questions about what's your health like today, what's your literacy like, and actually thinking that was the personal progression plan, which it's not, uh, which kind of did suggest, uh, again, a kind of standardized, formulaic, generic way of developing this. And again, that's about fitting people into the categories that uh, they need to, to be fitted into from the government's perspective. And you know, a lot of this is top down driven from the Department of Social Protection as well. It's not the provider's fault per se. So I don't know if anybody else wants to come in there. Yeah, Joe? Yeah, I, I might just respond to your point, Michael, around the uh, people not knowing, kind of, that, they, that they'd taken part in developing a personal progression plan or, um, and I found in my own work that sometimes people didn't know what payment they were on. So when you ask them what payment they're on, they weren't sure they knew it was maybe a job seekers type payment, but they weren't certain. Um, and I think when people find themselves in front of an entry officer, they're often, not always, but often at a low ebb. Um, and, you know, I think losing employment can be a traumatic experience, you know, um, and there's not that sort of holistic approach to people. It's very procedural, it's very process-based. So it's not a great surprise to me that people wouldn't um, be able to recall the details of what plan they were on or you know, what payment they were on when they're often just trying to keep their, their heads above water and are being subject uh, to processes that can exacerbate uh, the stress they bring uh, to, to the intro office in the first place. So I have picked up on that in my own work too, that sometimes people don't know the finer details of the process. They just know that they're in this sort of um, the storm of bureaucracy where they have to keep satisfying certain conditions in order to you know, maintain their payment. And so I think that kind of speaks to the missing component of how we do welfare in Ireland in that there isn't a social care dynamic to it. And it's a very process and sort of procedural based uh, approach which can be you know can be very very um damaging and harmful uh to people when they're they're in a, a very vulnerable space and i use the word vulnerable with some hesitation because i don't i think it, it can disempower as a term but you know i think when people find themselves in need of assistance and employment they often are vulnerable at least in that aspect of, of their lives um so yeah, it's just something that I picked up on as well in my own work is that people don't always know the finer details of, of the process. They're just trying to survive often, you know? And so I just thought it might be worth mentioning in the context of your own comment. Great, thanks, Joe. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one more comment uh, and then we're, we're coming up to, we've just gone past 1.30. Um, and so uh, if anyone has anything else that they'd like to say, We're good. Well, I might... well, I might hand over to Michael then to, to close us off and just to thank you all. Thank you. I'll just respond very quickly. I did see one comment in there about in, in, in the Q&A about whether the it was to do with the length of people's duration of unemployment as to why we might be seeing that difference in the LES between, uh, you know, this emphasis on work experience uh, and, and further in higher education. I think it's an important point. I mean, I would say, uh, and I talk a little bit about it in the report, that that was drawing on some of the research with the frontline staff, that that was one of the considerations that they were dealing with people who were unemployed for five, 10 years in some cases, and that's what would be steering them towards um, TUS or CE, for example. Uh, but it's also important to make it point out here that the, many of the people who were participating in job path were also very long-term unemployed people too. Um, uh, so that's not an exclusive experience of the, the local employment services. Um, so just to, to, to wrap up, uh, I mean, if I, I like to thank you all for for joining this session this afternoon again enormous thanks to the people that actually participated in this research where uh, and in the broader project that i've been doing over the past few years so that includes the, the frontline staff that have also been involved in this research as well as their the service users and the job seekers and i want to very much thank the work that orla and Anne have done behind the scenes uh, at Muzi uh, in facilitating this webinar uh, this is i think probably the fourth one i think that Neil and i have been part of together with orla and Anne. and unfortunately it's going to be the last one that we'll be doing together because the various projects that we're working on are, are, are closing uh, uh, at the end of the year 
Um, and also very much to thank Breed and Anne-Marie for their comments uh, and responses today. I know it can be a tricky thing discussing uh, papers uh, in, in this kind of seminar format, but you've done tremendous work drawing on the extensive knowledge and experience you, of course, both have of this sector. Um, so thank you enormously for your time and obviously to Joe and Philip, whose work I've learned from too uh, and very much enormous thanks to Nula Whelan who's chaired this so expertly and steered us through I think a really uh, fruitful uh, hour and a half or so of, of, of discussion and it's been an absolute pleasure working with Nula over the past two years so I'll, I'll miss sharing the office insofar as we've been able to be in the office together <laughs> with, with Nula and uh, I know Nula will continue to do important work in this space too um, she's staying at Maynooth University for time yet so do watch watch this space uh, and in the meantime may I wish you all a very happy Christmas and new year uh, and I hope um, you have a, a restful holiday period in so far as we can so thank you very much thanks everyone and just maybe just to say one final thing that Michael is uh, heading back to the uh, southern hemisphere to uh, to Australia in the new year so uh, we'll miss him very much but we'll be keeping an eye on what he does next. Uh, the world is not so small, so we'll be sharing experiences and hoping to hear how his research progresses uh, on his return to Melbourne. So thanks, Michael. So we leave it there and thank you all very much and have a nice Christmas. Yeah, thanks very much. <laughs>